Witchcraft, the Earth Religion. It has been with us since before civilization began, but not until now could its secrets be revealed. Early man forged out his beliefs based on a closeness with nature, a necessary closeness we are trying to again recapture. Out of the darkness were handed down teachings by which man could control his destiny rather than weakly submit to the whims of fate. We owe our knowledge of these secrets to certain individuals who, while others struggled in hopeless desperation, relentlessly pursued the magical properties of our world to become masters of their environment. Those who were successful in dealing with the supernatural forces were the first witches and magicians, and their power can be yours, if you choose to take it. A caution, however. Those seeking Satan worship, black masses, human sacrifices, and pacts with the devil had best look elsewhere. The practice of witchcraft grew thousands of years before the fantasy of devil worship was created by the Christian Church in an effort to maintain an iron grasp on its members. Satanism is a relatively modern concept, completely apart from the ancient practice of true witchcraft. Christianity was a man-made religion, as opposed to the natural, gradual development of the earth religion. Practitioners of the magical arts, possessing knowledge of celestial influences and the occult properties of herbs, gems, and metals, were forced to hide their activities for their own safety. The persecution of witches was sustained for centuries until their secrets were driven into hiding, and in many cases were passed on solely by word of mouth. But individual witches and secret covens did survive, so that we have inherited a vast body of magical knowledge with which to carry on in the art of witchcraft. The wise philosophers of ancient times thought of witchcraft and magic as the perfect knowledge of natural things. Those who would practice these arts must first understand nature. By observing nature, the early magicians found in the animal, vegetable, and mineral kingdoms the same sympathies and antipathies as those ruling human existence, and by experimenting, learn to turn these natural attractions and repulsions to useful advantage in the service of man. Medieval sorcerers compounded oils for magical uses containing aromatics, fragrant extracts, and spices which produce special effects, on their sensitive and psychic consciousness, of course. An odor often produces an instinctive physical reaction before it is consciously perceived. This is partly an appeal to man's primitive nature when he placed a greater reliance on the sense of smell in the early days of his evolution. The use of incense in magical ceremonies is designed to act as a psychological stimulant, subtly heightening the mood and simultaneously providing an atmosphere conducive to spiritual contact. The knowledge of these mental and physical responses and the oils and herbal compounds that control them is a powerful tool of the complete magician. The proper incense places the magician in a position to better receive revelations from the spirits hovering around us. For control of odiferous vibrations, it is often the essential element for tearing away the veil between ours and the unseen world. As we shall see, incense can also be used to gain the affection of the opposite sex, ensure success in business, and safeguard against higher spiritual enemies, and for many, can induce a clairvoyant state or even the out-of-body experience known as astral projection. So it is with all of our raw materials, be they herbs, roots, oils, metals, or whatever may be dictated in a particular working, the accomplished practitioner is master of them all. He knows the personality of each and how it fits into the overall scheme of things. But, most importantly, he is sensitive to the qualities which he may utilize in shaping reality to his will. And this, after all, is the ultimate reason for the existence and practice of witchcraft. The acquisition of supernatural powers requires mental and physical discipline, 
which few people naturally possess. However, everyone has within them the potential for magical attainment if they are willing to work to develop their skills. A witch must first of all develop a will of fire. You must begin to assert yourself on all the levels of your existence. This will be the means by which you will focus all of your energies during your magical operations. In order to sharpen your will into a glistening steel point, it would be well to utilize certain exercise designed to build concentration and expand your mental capabilities. Gazing at a single candle flame is a good beginning. In doing so, do not allow your mind to wander at all. Simply keep your attention totally fixed on the flame, thinking of nothing else. Another useful exercise is to try visualizing a certain object, such as a chair or book, and not to let the thought of any other thing come into your mind. How complicated the object is and how specific your image of it will be good tests of your concentration. It must be realized that the purpose here is not to develop will for its own sake, but to temper it with discipline, so that you have a powerful magical tool with which to weave your spells, not just a selfish extension of your desires. Deep feelings are not to be ignored and shouldn't be suppressed unless they are of a destructive nature, in which case the self-discipline learned will guide the aspiring witch along the proper path. Remember, you are trying to develop your magical abilities for constructive purposes and not play God. It is usually the impetuous witch, acting without carefully thought out goals and objectives, that will make careless and potentially dangerous mistakes. Will is the important tool, but without the proper discipline and self-control, it has no magical value. After will, your most important asset is imagination, the ability to fabricate within your mind's eye all manner of images that will spark your emotion into a raging bonfire of energy. All of the greatest witches and sorcerers possess this power in abundance, and the success of your magic will depend on just how emotionally worked up you can get over your spells. This is partially the reason behind the atmosphere created for a ritual and the various ceremonial garments and implements, such as the robe, the knife, and the chalice. Aside from their inherent magical value, they have a decided psychological effect in creating the proper state of mind so necessary for successful practice of the arts. Since memory is a useful device for sparking blasé emotions to the required crackling intensity, this is known to witches as linking or picking up your contacts. Here is a good exercise for your development in this area. Remove yourself to a quiet place where you will have no interruptions. A private spot in the forest would be ideal, but a special room where you will not be disturbed should serve equally well. First, assume a comfortable seated posture, one in which you can totally relax. Now close your eyes and begin to erase all thoughts. This is known in Eastern philosophies as blanking of the mind. In this way, you will be entirely free to create any images required at any time. Breathe deeply and slowly leaving just a blue velvet haze across your mental horizon. Now, think of something happy, perhaps a meaningful memory from the past that made you laugh or just glad to be there. Now, think of something that made you sad, something that made you cry. Now, really feel it. Alternate between these two emotional extremes. Stay on the memory as long as necessary to make you happy and then sad. Reverse these two emotions slowly at first, then faster, until you can finally go through either mood on instant demand. Practice with other emotions and other senses, love, hate, courage and fear, anger and compassion.
You and you alone must work to build your own inner consciousness. Be ever observant of your world. Go to nature and learn. Set yourself in harmony with the rhythms of the season and the movement of the celestial bodies. Explore alone or with that person closest to you. Watch the sunrise and listen to the animals of the forest. Drink of nature's nectars and breathe the scent of wildflowers. Feel Mother Earth beneath your naked feet. You will become the complete master of your senses. You'll gain new confidence in yourself and feel a strange new energy charging through every fiber of your body. Couple this energy with your vigorous imagination and your fiery will, and you have the makings of true magical power. Now, it is not mandatory that a witch or magician worship any particular god or group of higher spirits, but one must have an awareness of their existence, and more importantly, their power. There is a hierarchy of supernatural beings at the top of which are the super-entities known as the Watchers, or simply the Gods. They are the archetypes of man, and their power exists in the deep mind of all of us. They can be contacted to bring energy to your rituals and success to your spells. But it is rare that they are actually evoked. They are the supreme deities possessors of absolute wisdom and bestowers of knowledge, love, and fertility. Next, there are the spirit entities, halfway between men and gods. These are the creations formed out of the primordial fire, eons before man evolved, and possessing superior intelligence to most men. They are the spirits of the deceased mortals, also referred to as shades. These are summoned through seances and rituals of necromancy, or raising of the dead. Finally, there are numerous minor elemental spirits, most of which are actually created by you, the magician in the process of spellcasting. They are unseen servants of your will, called into being through the application of your magical power. They spring from your formulas, talesmans, symbols and incantations for the performance of a task. They must never, ever be let out of command of the magician who created them. Although they possess nothing approaching the power of the higher entities, they can cause interference and annoyance if uncontrolled, and are best done away with after their assistance has been utilized. Remember, the cardinal rule in spiritual contact on all levels is that you, are the master of any situation or occasion. Lower spirits are always to be treated with absolute firmness, while the gods and demons are met with the courtesy and respect due them. These are power sources, centers of both good and evil, to be dealt with wisely. That is what witchcraft is, the craft of the wise. Use it. Guided by wisdom, and your deepest hopes and desires may be realized. You must be in command, always, and under no circumstances enter into any bargain with a spirit entity. To do so would tear down your power as a witch and effectively halt your personal magical evolution. Learn your craft well, then apply it responsibly and with intelligence. Any witch or magician needs a place to practice their craft. A secret room set aside for just this purpose is ideal. However, almost any room can be converted into a chamber of magic with little difficulty. The only requirements are a space large enough to draw a magic circle of protection, usually nine feet across, and a low table serving as an altar on which to place the magical implements needed. Some mystical symbols or embellishing may be added for a heightening atmosphere as long as they have meaning for the practitioner. Such a room will, in the truest sense of the word, serve as a temple, so that when the magician performs a ritual, it will be sacred to him. In certain areas, it has been traditional to wear no clothes at all during rituals, but it is equally traditional to wear ritual garments, such as a robe, 
or cape, for magical ceremonies, the choice is yours. Now, to begin the practice of witchcraft, certain basic tools will first be needed. They are the aids used in the accomplishment of miracles, and as such are symbols of magical power. They are to be regarded with awe and never used for anything other than their intended purposes. Their value rises with careful and attentive use and is lost through misuse. The magician will never reach for his magical instruments unless he has undergone the proper, necessary mental preparation and cleansing, so that he is absolutely ready to meet the universal forces. The working tool can be either purchased or individually fashioned, but before being used they must be purified and demagnetized through the ritual of fire and water. This is known as exorcism. They are then recharged in accordance with the magician's concentrated will. In this way, unwanted negative vibrations are removed, being replaced by the magician's own personal vibration. Ritual Cup or Chalice It is used to contain the wine of celebration or the enchanted water of exorcism. It is also employed to mix the various potions and formulae in. It is regarded as female in nature, symbolizing space, night, darkness, and the sea. It should be a fairly large, footed goblet, preferably of silver or pewter, although crystal or ceramic will serve also. Thurible or Magic Sensor It contains glowing coals on which to place incense powders and various herbs during rituals. A metal incense burner or pottery bowl will suffice. It symbolizes the materialization of spirit entities and through the use of the proper incense provides the atmosphere necessary for the evocation of a spirit. It can, in a like manner, also be used to banish spirits. Athame or black-handled knife. It is used to draw the magic circle and other diagrams, and to inscribe symbols in the air. It stands for the material element of fire and is symbolic of victory and superiority over any adversity. A white-handled knife is usually used for any preliminary cuttings or carvings preparatory to a ceremony. The Magic Cord This is used primarily to measure the radius of circles and for the binding of initiates, and is worn about the waist when not in use. It is made of braided red cord, six feet long, with a loop on one end and knots tied at three and one-half, four and four and a half feet from the loop. It will serve as a compass to strike the arcs of the magic circle. The final major tool is the Book of Shadows, in which all spells, rituals, and magical information is recorded. It is the personal record of your magical progress and must be guarded from prying eyes. This workbook can be a simple paper tablet or as formal as parchment bound in leather or velvet. These, then, are the primary tools. Other supplies of immediate need are self-igniting charcoal blocks, salt, preferably in rock crystal form, frankincense, and chalk or white tape for laying out floor diagrams. The tools are then consecrated in the following manner. At a time when the moon is waxing, assemble all of your tools except the athame at your ritual altar. A white candle should be burning at each side. Cast some new salt into your chalice containing water, saying, Water and earth, where you are cast, no spell nor adverse purpose lasts. Be in accord with only me, and as my word, so mote it be. Traditional herbs such as rosemary, mint, and ditany of Crete may also be added for additional strength, making this your water of exorcism. Now, Cast frankincense crystals onto glowing charcoal in the thurible, saying, Creature of fire, this charge I lay, no spirit in thy presence stay. Hear my will addressed to thee, and as my word, so mote it be. To exercise your athame, you must wait until the moon is waning. 
Shortly before midnight, in your chalice filled with water, add ground ginger, black pepper, some dragon's blood resin, a pinch of wolfbane, and a drop of your own blood. Cast some of these herbs onto a glowing charcoal in your thurible, and at the stroke of midnight, place the blade of the knife into the burning coals. When the blade is hot, plunge it into the herbal infusion in your chalice, saying, Blade of steel, I conjure thee to ban such things as named by me. As my word, so mote it be. This process is repeated three times. Then remagnetize the athame by stroking the blade thirty-six times on each side with a lodestone or magnet, repeating these words. Blade of steel, I conjure thee, attract all things as named by me, and as my word, so mote it thee. These, then, are the tools of your craft. To maintain their value, they should be locked away in a secret closet or chest. They are to be used only when there is magic to be done. Handle them with care, treat them with respect, and they will serve you well. Foretelling the future is accomplished in many ways. Some of the more common means are examining tea leaves, questioning a Ouija board, or reading tarot cards. These fall under the influence of mercury. Another method, however, that is not as well known, is by inducing a prophetic dream. This spell is lunar by nature, for the moon rules sleep and dream. It is done when the moon is waxing. Concentrate on the question to be asked during the day. Then, in your bedroom, before retiring, burn an incense composed of powdered aloes, white sandalwood, ground cucumber seeds, jasmine, and a pinch of camphor. While this is burning, take a warm bath in which a small amount of the following formula has been added. Equal parts of oil of peppermint, oil of lavender, oil of rosemary, a pinch of powdered poppy seed, and a pinch of thyme. Before going to sleep, write your question on a piece of parchment paper and place it, along with a small packet of wormwood herb wrapped in white silk, under your pillow. If the conditions are right, you will have the answer by morning. In matters of love, we call on the Lady of Delight, the Enchantress of the Heart, Aradia. She is mistress of the moon and patroness of the flowers. The influence of Aradia is great and her aid is desirable in all spells of romance. Clad in garments of silver, a wreath of flowers about her flowing hair, and a white dove perched upon her right hand. She is the image of beauty and love. This working is best performed on a Friday at eight in the morning or ten at night, at a time when the moon is waxing. By the light of two red candles, fashion an image of the person toward whom the spell is being directed. Make it of paraffin or beeswax. Create a magical connection using object links, such as a snip of hair of the loved one, or nail clippings set into the wax form. A piece of their clothing will help to intensify the connection between this miniature and the actual person. Now, make a waxen image of yourself in a like manner. Then, at the proper hour, cast the circle and let the ritual begin. On glowing charcoal burn an incense of powdered sandalwood, rose petals, and dragon's blood while conjuring in your mind's eye a vision of our idea. Summon her presence by saying, By the strength of the all-powerful ones, I conjure thee, our idea, by the moon and by the dove, carry out this work of love. Echo, echo, our idea. Repeat this three times. The atmosphere of warmth and love 
will then tell you she is there. The wax images are held in the smoke of the incense and named for the two individuals, and then placed in the center of the altar, about one foot apart. The female image is always on the left, and the male image is on the right. Now, concentrate on your task, gaining a firm mental picture of the loved one, complete with all the facets of their personality. Add more incense to the charcoal and move the wax images a little closer together. Breathe freely and become totally involved in your spell. Summon up all your feelings of warmth and love and send them now to this special person. And every few minutes move the images a little closer until, finally, they are face to face touching. It is then that you say, O oh, Great Mother, bestower of all fruitfulness, bring these two hearts together that we may be touched by their rosy love. All throughout our lives, as my will, so mote it be. Blessed be our idea, blessed be. The evocation of a spirit requires great preparation and care. The magician must know which entity he desires to contact, what planetary sphere it operates in, and finally, what the purpose of the evocation is. This falls into the area of magic known as divination, so you will need, in addition to the other tools, a magical wand of divination, symbolic of your absolute will and power, and a crystal ball or magic mirror in which you will capture the image of the spirit being conjured. The wand is made of fruit wood or hazel, 12 to 18 inches long. The gazing crystal or showstone may be of a natural or an optical crystal. It is laid on a black cloth. In place of a crystal ball, a magic mirror may be used with equal advantage. This is simply a concave clock or watch glass, painted black on the convex side. Exercise these with water containing salt and wormwood, incense made of cinnamon, mastic and frankincense. Repeat an incantation of your own, stating your intended purpose for the wand and the showstone. The spirit you will first conjure is the intelligence of the Venus sphere, named Hagio. She is useful to contact in matters of love and luck and success. It is best to carry out this evocation on a Friday at 10 p.m., when the moon is waxing, although Tuesday at midnight is almost as good. Assemble all of your materials well in advance. You'll need pen and ink for writing, some parchment paper, and some special incense composed of cinnamon, rose petals, and coriander seed. A circle nine feet in diameter is laid down around your altar. It can be painted or simply made with chalk or white tape. On the altar will be your magical implements. The showstone, or magic mirror, is the center surrounded by an equal lateral triangle drawn on the altar top. At either side are the lamps of art, or altar candles. Having bathed and put on the magical garments, return to the ceremonial place. Light the candles and charcoal, and at the appointed time, enter the circle and let the ritual begin. Take your athame and in a clockwise direction, beginning in the east, mentally redraw the circle, visualizing a blue-white fire coming off of the blade, leaving a trail of violet flames. Imagine yourself surrounded by a ring of magical light. Do not leave this circle for any reason until the ritual is completely finished. Cast frankincense onto the glowing charcoal and sprinkle water of exorcism in the east, south, west, and north. Next, draw the symbol of Hagiel on a piece of parchment paper. Cast the special incense into the thurible and asperge and fumigate the symbol three times, saying each time, Creature of paper, I name thee Hagiel. Now, 
With the paper in the left hand and taking the wand in the right, trace the symbol in the smoke of the incense three times, repeating each time. Creature of paper, thou art Hagiel. Find the spell with these words, so mote it be. Place this symbol on the altar in front of the showstone and retrace the triangle around it with the athame, mentally communicating your wish for Hegel to appear there. Place the athame in your belt. Take up the wand of divination in your right hand and move clockwise once around the circle, finishing in front of the altar. Raise the wand overhead and evoke Hegel, saying, by Alcolum and Adamil, I conjure thee, Hagio. Again, circumambulate the circle, and this time say, By Gesa and Gesoa, I conjure thee, Hagio. Bring thy presence into this glass, so that we may behold thy countenance. Circumambulate a last time and say, by Orif and Odumi, I thrice conjure thee, Hagiel, descend and appear, revealing thy secrets, that we may profit from thy great and abundant knowledge. Now sit in front of the showstone and mentally impregnate it with an emerald green light. Concentrate on the question or purpose for conjuring this entity, fixing your eyes on the glass. It may cloud over with a cloudy mist, but do not shift your gaze. Hagel may appear to answer your questions or may reveal the answer through a series of images that unfold as the mist clears. Images may appear at the side of your gaze, but do not move your line of vision. This is of the utmost importance. The visions are fleeting and sometimes symbolic. They will finally stop forming and the glass will become cloudy. For the last time, place more incense in the thurible and terminate the conjuration with a license to depart. O oh, great Hagio, we have been pleased by thy presence, and now license thee depart in peace to thy proper sphere. And as my word, so mote it be. Under no circumstances leave the circle without doing this. This applies even if there are no visual signs of a successful evocation, for a spirit may have manifested itself in the form not immediately recognizable. Record carefully your visions for the future reference. Even the seemingly meaningless ones are often the basis for revelations when subjected to meditation at a later time. This basic procedure may be used for most other spirits, with modifications made for the type of intelligence involved and its sphere of influence. The time has come to lay warning of others who tread the path of witchcraft. Even if you have taken the utmost precautions to maintain the secrecy of your practice, your presence in the magical world will be felt nonetheless. There are those who jealously guard their power and are resentful of others likewise possessing the secrets of old. These could be rival witches and magical practitioners, those who have already passed over to the other realm, or higher spirit entities. An unseen attack may render one very accident-prone or induce a period of exceptionally bad luck through manipulation of the subconscious mind. In the case of more dangerous opponents, spirit servants may be sent to render you harm and misfortune in a more direct manner. Reoccurring nightmares are sometimes an early sign of occult aggression against you, especially if they repeat a specific theme. These are usually not the goal of a magical attack in themselves, but are simply an omen of warning from the deep mind to the conscious mind. If protective measures are not taken, you may discover yourself having waking dreams or possibly mental delusions in the form of voices, visual deceptions, or imaginary smells. In some cases there will be indications of a haunting while elemental spirits known as poltergeists may deal out such mischief 
about the house is hiding commonly used objects, having articles jump off of shelves, or provoking a mysterious eruption of fire. An advanced adversary could send his own consciousness in the form of an animal to accomplish his ends. So be aware of any strange birds or beasts around you. The most successful charm allowing your power over all ill-wishing spirits and demons is the pentagram. You can wear a talisman of the pentagram with a single point skyward engraved on metal or drawn on parchment. Exercise it, charge it with your magical energy and purpose, and it will be your own. A magical attack will usually come by night during the waning of the moon. Here is a good spell for protecting the home. Just before sunset, consecrate an area of the ground in front of the doorstep with salt water and angelica root, and bury a knife with its point facing away from the house. Over the freshly covered ground, burn some juniper wood and say, In Hertha's name, I ask that this structure and all those who live within be protected from malice and evil. Near and far, during the day and throughout the night, for each of these thirteen moons of the year, and as my will, so mote it be. Hertha is the earthly guardian and mother of all life, the embodiment of earth power. Concentrating on her power for protection, take your ritual athame in your right hand and walk around the house in a clockwise direction three times, leaving an imaginary trail of purifying light. To detect someone in your presence who is possessed by evil spirits, Add a pinch of Dittany of Crete to the incense, and they will flee its odor. These are all good means to guard against general ill wishes and bad vibrations. However, the best protection from all out sorcery and black magic is the witch's familiar. Now this could be a pet with which you have a close rapport, traditionally a black cat or a raven. The animal can be charged with a spell which will be released and anyone in its presence attempting evil magic against you. Another type of familiar is an elemental servant in the form of a miniature animal or man. This is a spirit or guardian created by your magic for the specific purpose of protecting you and your home. The most famous protective of this kind is made from the mandrake root. This is the mandragore, and it is traditionally made from the European mandrake. However, there are other plants in the same family which can be used to equal advantage. These include white bryony or English mandrake, the American mandrake, henbane, deadly nightshade, and the devil's apple, also known as jimson weed or the datura plant. Care must be taken as all of these are quite poisonous. During the waxing of the moon, by the light of three white candles, Carve the root into an image with features of the sex opposite your own. This is done with your ritual knife while repeating a meaningful phrase expressive of your purpose, such as, In Hertha's name, you are my protector. You then bury the carved root near a crossroads at the hour of midnight. With your athame, Draw a circle clockwise around the spot and pour over the area a mixture of twelve parts water, one part milk, and a drop of your own blood. It must remain in the earth for twenty-eight days, during which it is to be watered regularly. When this time has elapsed, again at midnight return to the spot. Redraw the circle and dig up your doll of protection. Clean the root and pass it through the smoke of vervain on burning charcoal, and then dry it out thoroughly. This process can be speeded up by placing it in an oven at low temperature for a few hours. When finished, your mandragore will be your house guardian. Keep it hidden in the room you are most apt to be in, or near the fireplace, if you have one, as many spirits enter down through the chimney. Remember, the most effective attack is the unexpected one. So be an alert witch 
and you can halt an evil spell or curse against you before it even begins. But don't bespangle yourself and your home with all manner of amulets and talismans and protectives, because this is only an indication to others of your limited magical attainment, and does not allow you to place enough reliance on yourself. Be confident of your strength and powers and use as few of these tools as necessary for adequate defense. And do not forget that the same laws of cause and effect apply if you weave up a work of black magic. Be wise. Now that you've begun, you still have a long journey ahead and much hard work, but the results will be so rewarding. Read as much as you can about the craft. Practice often, until soon it will be as second nature to you as walking or breathing. You may even want to start your own coven. Whichever path you embark upon, rest with your will.